And what I'm going to talk about in the, in the first uh, talk is mecha basically mechanisms of ventilator-induced lung injury. And I've entitled this From Barotrauma to Biotrauma because many of us understand, um, if we trained a number of years ago, there was a large focus on barotrauma, but I think that there's been a shift in how we think about mechanical ventilation, how we think about the injury caused by mechanical ventilation, with more of a focus on what uh, we've called biotrauma, and I'll, I'll explain that um, as we go along. So what I'd like to do uh, the next few minutes is give you a brief historical review of, and this is very brief historical review, really just a vignette to the past about uh, ventilator-induced lung injury, talk about current concepts related to villi, talk about the systemic effects of ventilator-induced lung injury, because I think these are very important potentially for uh, explaining why and how patients die on a ventilator, and then talk about implications for therapy. So let me get started with this, this historical uh, vignette. This is taken from a, a journal, which uh, probably not too many of you read. This is the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society of Medicine. And as you can see down here, this was taken from an article published in 1744. So two, over 250 years ago, uh, we've got this article. And it relates to observations of a case published in the last volume of the medical essays of, a of recovering a man dead in appearance by distending the lungs with air. So you can tell already where mechanical ventilation may play a role. So this had to do with a, um, a physician, Tosak, uh, and I, these are direct quotes. Tosak came upon a man who had suffocated because of fumes from a coal pit. So he came upon a patient who was basically pulseless, not breathing, and Tosak wasn't sure what to do. So what he did was he applied his mouth close to the patients, and by blowing strongly, raised his chest fully. He immediately felt six or seven quick beats of the heart. In one hour, the patient began to come to himself. Within four hours, he walked home, and in as many days, returned to work. So clearly, pretty good outcome from what we would consider uh, CPR. Did mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, some chest compression, and th this is the outcome. Now, that's interesting of itself because CPR didn't really advance for, many, for a couple of centuries after this uh, observation. But I thought this was interesting because if you read the discussion of this paper, there was an important uh, point. So Tosek said, some had suggested a bellows, that is, um, using the equivalent of a ventilator, a bellows to blow gas into the lung. But blowing would be preferable as the lungs of one man may bear without injury as great a force as those of another man, which by the bellows cannot almost be determined. So clearly, what he was thinking about in this discussion by saying without injury was that bellows could produce injury to the lung and that it may be if you use mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation because you're limited in the pressure you can generate, limited in the distension you can cause in the lung, that might minimize ventilator-induced lung injury. Now, this was 250 years ago. I think much of this was forgotten for the next couple of hundred years at, at least but clearly, I think, presages what we now think about in terms of trying to minimize the injury due to mechanical ventilation. So now that the disease we're dealing with usually is not patients who have problems due to fumes from a coal pit, but one of the more difficult patients to deal with are those with acute lung injury and ARDS. ARDS, as you all know, is a syndrome um, that's characterized by, by wet lungs, increased alveolar capillary permeability, patients have stiff lungs, they're often hypoxemic, or they're always hypoxemic. And we need mechanical ventilation to keep these patients alive. Without mechanical ventilation, most of these patients would certainly die. It's also a disease that is an inflammatory disease characterized by mononuclear cells, neutrophils, and an inflammatory exudate in the alveoli. From an epidemiologic perspective, uh, the mortality still remains quite high. Despite improvements in therapy, mortalities, if you take all comers, not just those in clinical trials where there's selection bias, the mortality still is 35 to about 60%. What's interesting, and I sort of hinted at that earlier, was that most patients don't die of respiratory failure. They don't die of severe, uh, severe hypoxemia, but they die of multiple system organ failure. And this has been a puzzle for most clinicians, for most scientists, for decades. Why is it that a disease that looks like it's largely confined to the lungs, although we know it's not, 
why do those patients die of something to do with other organs rather than the lung? And the hypothesis I want to present and discuss as I go along is perhaps mechanical ventilation, this therapy which is fundamental in keeping these patients alive, may actually play a major role in leading to their demise later on if it's not done appropriately. So before going on to the mechanisms of ventilator induced lung injury, I think it's useful to have to think about some key physiologic concepts for us to bear in mind when we both when we think about this talk, but I think when you when you take care of patients at the bedside. So the first concept is that ARDS is a heterogeneous disease. For many years we thought that ARDS was relatively homogeneous. If you look at the PA chest x-rays of a patient, it looks like there's infiltrates sort of everywhere. It looks relatively homogeneous. We now know and have known for actually a couple of decades that it's a heterogeneous disease. And this is largely based on CT scan data from a number of groups. Uh, Lucci, this is taken from Gatinoni's uh, group. You can see on the left a CT scan of a patient on a peep of five centimeters of water. And you can see the heterogeneity in the distribution at least of, of consolidation, uh, fluid, and open um, alveolar units. You can see here that much of the consolidation collapses in the dependent lung regions with relatively open um, non-dependent lung regions. When PEEP is applied here with 15 centimeters of water, you can see that there's recruitment of some lung units, which will be discussed uh, a little later on in this meeting, how the lung gets recruited, but there's still heterogeneity. So that helps us, I think, think about that this has implications for how we ventilate patients. You can imagine that if you're ventilating with a normal size tidal volume, but only this much lung, or you could say this much lung is available for, for receiving that volume, then in fact you might over distend certain lung units. Now that's looking at CT scans. What does this look like sort of in, in real life, if you like? Well, I don't, I don't have patient, I don't have data from patient, but this is taken from the Handbook of Physiology a long time ago, 40 years ago, but I think is as relevant today. On the upper panel, I've copied from the handbook a pressure volume curve. You don't see anything yet. On the x-axis is transpulmonary pressure, the pressure across the lung. On the y-axis is volume that enters the lung. And at each one of these points, I'm going to show you what the picture of the lung looks like. So if we move along, you can see the pressure goes up to 4 centimeters of water. Very, very little increase in volume, as you can see. Go to 8 centimeters of water. A little bit more increase in volume, very little, and you can see that on the picture. The white here represents um, areas that are inflated. At this point here, what's been called the lower inflection point, you can see a marked increase in volume. The compliance uh, increases markedly, and you can see that there's volume entering the lung. But as you can see, it's vetter, very heterogeneously in inflated. The next um, inflation to 16 centimeters of water, the lung looks uh, more inflated. And finally, at 20 centimeters of water, remember this is transpulmonary pressure. This is an open lung, this is a, an ex vivo lung. The lung looks homogeneously inflated. Look what happens on deflation. And this is going to show you what hysteresis means. You can see that as we decrease the, the pressure, the volume at any given pressure remains quite a bit higher. Uh, on deflation than on inflation. You can see what that means physically. That means the lung is much more inflated, much more homogeneously inflated. And as one goes further and further down in the pressure and the pressure volume curve, one starts to get deflation and at end expiration you can see the lung is fully deflated. So I think this picture is worthwhile bearing in mind when you're taking care of patients and you're ventilating them as to what might happen. Clearly it's very different than the real life situation with a chest wall, this is an ex vivo, no chest wall. But a couple points. You can see that, first of all, the lower inflection point. Even when you're above the lower inflection point, does not mean the lung is homogeneously inflated or fully inflated. In fact, it's not until further up, well up on the pressure volume curve, that the lung is reasonably fully inflated. Secondly, you can see the effect of a re recruitment maneuver if you go up to this point here, which is close to total lung capacity, and you come down, even at the same pressure, the lung is much more homogeneously inflated. And third, I think this gives you a good feel for what hysteresis is all about when you hear the term hysteresis. So that, I think, is what happens. That's what, what the lung looks like um, statically, if you like, because each one of these inflations was a static inflation. You put gas in, you wait for a few seconds statically. 
I think it's useful to, to see what happens when a lung is inflated during mechanical ventilation. And for this, we've got uh, an ex vivo lung again, but now this is being ventilated, and this is a, a movie of uh, a, a, this is a rat lung that's being ventilated. You'll see as the lung is being ventilated, I just stopped the movie for a second. You'll see there are areas of collapse, as shown here. Even at end in inspiration, there are areas of collapse. There are areas that were relatively normally inflated, as you can see here. At this point, we've increased the peep to, to 10 or 15 centimeters of water. You can see with each breath, some of the lung is being recruited. So when we talk about recruitment later on, have this image in mind. What happens as the lung is being recruited? So there's a couple points here. You can see that this recruitment takes time. This is about the third or fourth breath. The final area to be recruited is here. You can see the lung now is homoge relatively homogeneously inflated, likely over distended to some extent, but homogeneously inflated. As ventilation continues, the lung stays inflated, but now we're going to go down to a peep of zero. You can see on the first breath, relative homogeneous inflation. The next breath, there's areas, these areas of atelectasis occur. And this can go on and on. So I think this is also an important uh, now moving image to bear in mind when you're taking care of patients. What happens in patients is clearly not exactly like this. There's a, a number of differences. Again, the chest wall uh, being an important one. But I think that we can take a number of messages from this. First of all, there can be heterogeneous inflation. You can see that the application of PEEP or recruitment maneuver takes time to recruit the lung. Even in this very simple model with not, n no injury, essentially, it took a few breaths to get full recruitment. The other point is, after full recruitment, if you go to a level of PEEP that's too low, derecruitment is going to occur, and it's going to occur quite quickly. So based on this movie and the, the previous, the previous uh, pictures I showed you, I think it gives a, a basis for now for us to think about mechanical ventilation, ventilator-induced lung injury. We can think about what happens in terms of overdistension, which I showed you down here. We can think about what happens when there's recruitment and derecruitment of the lung. Can that cause um, some injury? So let's move on to, to mechanisms of ventilator-induced lung injury. The first one I want to focus on is something called volume trauma. The, the concept here was first developed by Webb and Tierney uh, in 1974, and it really a classic article in which they ventilated rat lungs, as shown here. They ran a, ventilated these vet lung, the rat lungs for about an hour. You can see here on the left, the ventilation occurred with peak inspiratory pressures of 14, and the lungs were removed at the end of an hour. It looked pretty normal. Here is a lung that was removed at an hour after ventilation with 45, peak inspiratory pressure of 15, of 45 rather. You can see also looks relatively normal. And here's another lung with peak inspiratory pressure of 45. This lung almost looks like its liver. It's full of fluid. It's fluid-filled, uh, wet, edematous. The difference between these two lungs is the peep level. This had a peep level of zero. This lung had a peep level of 10. And this protective effect of PEEP is one of the concepts we'll be discussing um, over the next couple of days in terms of mechanical ventilation and ventilator induced lung injury. These data back um, 30 years ago clearly showed us that mechanical ventilation can lead to diffuse alveolar damage, as shown on, on the right here, that ventilator settings were important. And these animals, in fact, most of them, many of them didn't live for the full hour. So very nice study by Webb and Tierney. Um, Didier Dreyfus and colleagues coined the term volume trauma, and I also demonstrated that lung stretch was the critical variable rather than uh, pressure per se at the airway opening. And the study was uh, relatively simple. They took rats, they ventilated them with high pressure or high and high volume. That is, they used a relatively high tidal volume, which meant that the pressures in the lung were increased, or they used high pressure, low volume. That is, they had a high pressure, low tidal volume by putting a band around the chest of the rats. So by putting a band around the chest, as they tried to push gas into the lung, the pressure was high because the compliance was decreased substantially, but the volume entering the lung was not very high. And what they found was that with the high pressure, high tidal volume, there was an increase in, in wet to dry weight ratio, which was quite significant. So the lungs were wet and edematous. That didn't occur with high pressure, low tidal volume. So showing that it's not pressure per se, that's important, but it was lung stretch, tidal volume, that's important. 
This is not really surprising if you think about um, much of what we do or, th or maybe we'll see this evening in terms of, uh, in terms of some jazz. This is from a, a paper by uh, Bauhaus published in Nature in 1969. His interest was not mechanical ventilation. His interest was the physiology of musical instruments. And as you can see here, this is on the y-axis lung volume, on the x-axis pressure. Here, this represents three different instruments. So this is an oboe. So here's a, a musician playing an oboe, blowing into the, into the oboe for about 30 seconds. You can see that the, the lung volume decreases over 30 seconds uh, and that the pressures generated are about 25 centimeters of water. Look what happens with a trumpet player. This is shown by number three. Blows for about five seconds. Volume decreases quickly. Look at the pressures generated. 150 centimeters of water. So a trumpet player is generating 150 centimeters of water at the airway opening hundreds, perhaps thousands of times a day. But trumpet players don't get barotrauma sort of every third or fourth breath. They don't have a problem with ventilator-induced lung injury. Why is that, even though the pressures are high? And the reason is that to generate these high pressures, it's necessary to generate a high pleural pressure, to generate the increased alveolar pressure, so the transpulmonary pressure, the pressure across the lung, is not increased. And in fact, there's no increased lung stretch. So what's important, clearly, is not the pressure at the airway opening necessarily, although it can be an index. What's important is the pressure across the lung or the change in volume. Now, in terms of volume trauma, I'm not going to spend much more time on volume trauma. Just to tell you that, if you summarize the studies that are out there, uh, clearly, the important issue is the over-distension of lung humans. That's the most important aspect. This can lead to diffuse alveolar damage, which can be manifest clinically as pulmonary edema. This can be rapid in onset. It appears to be more rapid in onset in smaller animals than larger animals. There's a number of mechanisms by which um, this can lead to injury. Mechanical factors can lead to capillary stress failure. But there's also more subtle uh, biochemical factors that I'm not going to discuss but the stretch-activated ion channels, for example, appear to be important. How does one at, uh, assess the propensity or the likelihood of getting barotrauma or volutrauma at the bedside? Well, usually when we think about the ventilation of patients, we often measure peak inspiratory pressure. And that's a pretty good index of uh, what's happening to some extent in the lung. But there's a couple of issues with using the peak inspiratory pressure. First of all, because it's measured at the airway opening during flow, the resistance of the endotracheal tube and the airways are important. The flow rate is important. The size of the endotracheal tube is important. All these factors can impact the development of the peak inspiratory pressure. So one can have very high peak pressures at the airway opening, which is out here, without necessarily having high pressures inside the lung. And clearly what's going to cause overdistension is what's happening inside the lung rather than just what's happening here. Now, another approach might be to say, well, let's look at a pressure that's closer to what's in the lung. And the plateau pressure has been proposed and is used relatively widely. So that's the pressure in the alveoli. But remember, what's important is the pressure across the lung. And in certain situations, especially patients who have stiff chest walls, patients, the best example I think is patients with ascites. You know, they have stiff ab abdomens, the chest wall includes the abdomen because you, the, when the diaphragm descends, you have to displace the abdomen so that one can have a high plateau pressure, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's increased lung stretch. So although most of the algorithms that deal with how you ventilate patients with ARDS say keep the plateau pressure less than some number, that's reasonable to think about, but that's not always the case. Certain patients, those with stiff chest walls, can have relatively high plateau pressures and yet not to be at increased risk for ventilator-induced lung injury. The next, the important factor, as I mentioned, is alveolar overdistension, the transpulmonary pressure, the pressure across the lung. That's something that's not often measured clinically, but certainly what we really want to get at. We want to know regional lung inflation. We want to know transpulmonary pressure if we can. So if one looks at the physical factors causing ventilator-induced lung injury, one area I haven't talked about in any detail just because of time, is adlect trauma. This is what happens at relatively low lung volumes when one ventilates and allows the lung to, to collapse and reopen, collapse and reopen. 
And whether this is the exact mechanism is unclear. Uh, Rolf, I think, has, Rolf Hubmeier has some different ideas of this, which he may talk about. But certainly we know that by using zero PEEP in, in animal models with ARDS can cause worse injury, no question about that. And we know that overventilation, overinflation of the lung can lead to barotrauma or volutrauma, gross barotrauma being air leaks, etc., and volutrauma being the increased alveolar capillary permeability. So those are the physical factors causing ventilator-induced lung injury. There's also a much more subtle form of injury, something we've called biotrauma or biological injury, biochemical injury, which um, we've been working on for about the past 10 years, which I think has, gives a, a, a hint as to potentially why patients may die of multiple system organ failure and may explain the increased injury that can occur with uh, mechanical ventilation. So this is from a paper published um, actually close to 10 years ago now. The hypothesis was that injurious ventilatory strategies, and those by the injurious ventilatory strategy, I mean those that I've talked about that over-distend the lung or those that cause the lung to repeatedly collapse and reopen or a combination of these two, can lead to an increase in inflammatory mediators and, and other mediators as well. We use a very simple uh, model to start with. That was an isolated rat lung, ex vivo. And that the reason for this was it allowed us to use very high volumes to mimic what happens regionally in the lung in humans. And it allowed us to have a opening and collapse of lung units because ex vivo, the lung collapses completely on the expiration. And all of these effects would be independent of, what, of hemodynamics. Because when we use this, such high tidal volumes, one is going to have impact on hemodynamics. And so here is the, the, uh, the model of how we did this. We took rats, uh, took out the lungs, and ventilated them for um, f two hours with four different ventilatory strategies, each shown here. One with relatively low PEEP, um, small tidal volume. This should be relatively protective in these normal, remember these are normal lungs to start with. We then used a higher PEEP level of 10, 15 ml per kilo tidal volume, 15 ml per kilo with PEEP or without PEEP. That's these two groups. And finally, we used a group that had roughly the same end inspiratory stretch, but zero PEEP. Large tidal volume, as you can see, 40 ml per kilo. And one could argue, well, is this clinically relevant? You know, we never would use 40 ml per kilo, obviously. But I think if, remember, these were normal lungs to start with. So if you think back to that CT scan that I showed you earlier from Gathnoni's study, some lungs can have three quarters of the lung are not available for ventilation because there's fluid, because there's collapse. In those lungs, if you use 10 ml per kilo and it only goes to a quarter of the lung, the regional lung stretch, because that's what's important, would be the equivalent of putting 40 ml per kilo into a normal lung. So of course, this is not directly clinically relevant, but it's not as far off as it may seem. We then ventilated for two hours, uh, did lung lavage, measured a number of things, and I'll only show you one slide here, or one graph here, this is tumor necrosis factor alpha, a key inflammatory cytokine, which you may all be familiar with, thought to be a key inflammatory cytokine in sepsis. You can see here that under control conditions, the bronchoalveolar lavage fluid had relatively low levels of TNF. Let me go back. Relatively low levels of TNF. When one went to this other group with medium volume high PEEP, that's the second, the second bar, you can see that there was an increase of roughly a factor of three in uh, TNF. Medium volume zero PEEP, this group here, had a further increase in, in uh, TNF. And finally, this last group here had a 50-fold increase. There's a break in the axis uh, of TNF simply based on two hours of ventilation. So here you have uh, mechanical ventilation, just two hours of ventilation, ex vivo lungs, which start off normal, and you can see that you have roughly 50-fold, you can get a 50-fold increase in TNF alpha, so a key mediator. So there, there have been uh, one or two studies that haven't been able to replicate that previous study I just showed you, but by far, if you look in the literature in terms of uh, in vitro, ex vivo, in vivo, and I'll show you some more in vivo data, clearly have shown that mechanical ventilation can have an impact on cytokine levels in the lung. Now, I'm not going to focus. There's a large literature now developed on the systemic consequence of, of sorry, on um, biotrauma, mechanism of biotrauma, et cetera. I'm not going to focus on those, 
I'm now going to switch gears a little bit and talk about potential systemic implications of biotrauma, because I think these are very clinically relevant, clinically important. So if one, if one stands back and thinks about mechanical ventilation and the lung, how might this lead to, to systemic inflammation? Well, the lung is unique. Um, it's, unique, it's uniquely placed to be a source of systemic inflammation. All of the circulation essentially goes through, through the lung. It has a huge vascular bed, and many, many neutrophils um, are kept in the circulation, just mar in the uh, marginated pool, neutrophil pool, which can be activated and then enter the lung relatively quickly. The lung also has a huge surface area and can be a portal of entry for many pathogens, which I'll briefly talk about. It's also metabolically active. The epithelium, the endothelium produce many, many mediators that can be released to enter the lung or enter the circulation. So with that as a background, we were interested in whether the findings we had in the ex vivo lung might have implications systemically as well. And this was a study published uh, a little over five years ago. David Chumello was the first author. This time we used uh, an acid aspiration model, took rats, put acid into the lung, which is, a very, I think, a very clinically relevant model of uh, acute lung injury, and then ventilated them with four ventilatory strategies. Large tidal volume, 16 ml per kilo, without PEEP or with PEEP, or lower tidal volume, without PEEP or with PEEP. And now, in addition to measuring things in the lung, we measured systemic cytokines. This is a plot of tumor necrosis factor alpha. Y axis, the X axis here is time. The Y axis is TNF levels in the serum. And you can see that in most, in most of the um, graphs shown here, that there's no increase in, in TNF over time. There was one group in which there's an increase. That's the high volume zero peep. That's this group right here. So with high volume zero peep, over distending the lung, allowing the lung to collapse completely, one got an increase in TNF alpha in the serum now. So I think that's important. This is not just what's happening in the lung. This is happening in the serum. The other, uh, I think, interesting point was that when we used five, just five centimeters of PEEP, which means end inspiration, there was more volume trauma, if you like. In fact, there was less um, um, serum cytokine level, less serum TNF. So I think this study showed that it's possible, ventilatory strategy, it's possible to change the amount or cause release of TNF from the lung into the systemic circulation, but also that PEEP can be protected. And there have been a number of studies that have addressed, uh, have addressed this. Stefan Uleg, who's going to speak uh, uh, a little later, had a very nice ex vivo model, uh, isolated ex vivo model, perfused, basically similar, um, similar results. Now, what are the mechanisms by which release of mediators might cause end organ dysfunction? Well, we're not sure entirely, but uh, we had a publication a couple of years ago in, in JAMA. Yumiko Amai was the first author, um, who's now moved to, uh, to Vienna. And this study e examined the effect of injurious mechanical ventilation looking at end organ dysfunction, and specifically looking at something called apoptosis, which I'll describe very briefly. So what we were interested in was to examine the effects of ventilator-induced lung injury on distal organ a number of aspects, but focusing on distal organ apoptosis. And the methods we used, we used uh, anesthetized rabbits given intratracheal uh, hydrochloric acid and randomized into groups and ventilated for eight hours. An injurious group with high tidal volume, zero PEEP, non-injurious, low tidal volume, high PEEP. And then measured a number of things, including hemodynamics, enzyme cytokines, um, as well as apoptosis by tunnel or electron microscopy. So in terms of hemodynamics, I'm not going to show you any data, but blood pressure in all groups was essentially uh, constant across the study. We looked at apoptosis using a tunnel assay because apoptosis, as you know, is programmed cell death. Cells can die uh, in general via two mechanisms, necrosis with spillage of, of the contents, inflammatory reaction, or apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. And is apoptosis important? Well, I'm just going to diverge for one, for one second. One of the key mediators in terms of apoptosis is something called FAST ligand, and FAST, you can show, shown here. And this is from a study from Atut Bello and colleagues. 
looking at soluble fast ligand in patients with ARDS who went on to live versus those who went on to die. And you can see that the levels, this is a log plot, were higher in those who ended up dying versus those who lived, suggesting that soluble fast ligand might be important. Of course, it doesn't prove anything specific, but at least suggested that it might be important. Let me now get back to the animal study, to the rabbit study. This is um, tunnel assay from the kidney, non-injurious versus an injurious animal. So we took the, the kidney, did, did sections, did this tunnel assay. You can see it's in the injurious group. There's these arrows pointing to these yellow dots, which may not come across so well with the lights on, but trust me, there's many more apoptotic positive cells in the animals ventilated with the injurious ventilatory strategy. This is quantified on the bottom. As you can see, non-injurious ventilatory strategy, relatively low apoptotic index. That's essentially a normalized value of number of uh, apoptotic cells versus the injurious ventilatory strategy. So remember here, what we're doing is we're ventilating lungs with two different strategies with a way that keeping mean airway pressure roughly the same. So blood pressure is essentially the same. And yet, we're finding marked differences in an outcome variable related to, related to the kidney. When we looked at the small intestine and the villi of the small intestine, you can see that there was also an increase in the apoptotic index shown at the bottom here in the animals ventilated with the injurious ventilatory strategy, but not in the CRIPS. So again, the important point here is here that ventilatory strategy can have an impact not only in the lungs, but on other organs. So what does this mean in terms of uh, our patients, our patients at the bedside? Well, you know, all the data I showed you to, until now uh, are, are animal data, and you could rightly ask, well, does this have any implication for humans? We don't ventilate too many rats or, or, uh, or rabbits in our ICU. Does this have relevance for humans? Well, I think it does have relevance for humans. This is taken from a study. Uh, Marco Ranieri was the first author. We looked at patients with um, ARDS who were randomized to receive a control ventilatory strategy, which was standard at the time, versus one which minimized stress. By minimized stress, meaning using a relatively high PEEP levels, minimizing the end inspiratory stretch. Here is the bronchoalveolar lavage, uh, the results for BAL in these patients. The x-axis here is entry to the study. 24 hours later, 36 hours later, you can see the y-axis is a log plot. You can see in the control group, essentially no change in TNF-alpha. In the group ventilated with minimal stress, you can see a marked decrease in, uh, in uh, TNF-alpha. Remember, this is a log plot. This is roughly a tenfold decrease in TNF-alpha. That's in the bronchovillar lavage. What about the serum? The same was true in the serum. Uh, it looked like the control group, if anything, had an increase in IL-6. This is another cytokine, interleukin-6, uh, and roughly a tenfold decrease in uh, IL-6 in the minimal stress group. If you think back to the data I showed you in the animal models, it looks very similar. Now, that's over a period of 36 hours. One question is, how quickly can this occur? And there's a very nice study uh, published uh, a few years ago by Stuber and colleagues in intensive care medicine that addressed this question. They took patients who were on a lung protective strategy until time zero, shown here. This is time on the x-axis. They then went to a lower PEEP, higher tidal volume strategy, which might be thought of as being somewhat more injurious. And then they went back to the lung protective strategy. And they measure cytokines uh, in the uh, blood of these patients. And as you can see, there were uh, five or six cytokines. There was a marked increase in cytokine levels within an hour of changing ventilatory strategy. So I think this is important because it suggests that just one hour of ventilation can have an impact on release of cytokines from the lung into the systemic circulation. When they went back at six hours to a lung protective strategy, you could see it took longer for the cytokines to return back to normal, but did return back. So again, other evidence in humans, in patients now, that ventilatory strategy impacts not just, on, uh, not just on gross physical factors, but also on biochemical factors. What, is, has, what has this meant? Well, I think you're all familiar with uh, publication in the New England Journal of Medicine in the year 2000, in which the uh, NIH investigators 
looked at comparing a small tidal volume strategy of uh, 6 ml per kilo predicted body weight, that's important, to 12 ml per kilo, showing a decrease in mortality at 28 days. There was roughly a 22% relative decrease in mortality in patients treated with the simple strategy, keeping the lung um, less, less inflated with 6 ml per kilo versus 12 ml per kilo. Well, what does this mean for the future? I'm just going to give you one example of how this might be useful about how we might think about novel non-ventilatory approaches. And I'll, I'll discuss sort of the future a little bit more uh, tomorrow uh, late afternoon. One question that arises is why do we need non, uh, novel non-ventilatory therapies? Why don't we just improve ventilation to the point where we don't have to use anything else? We have completely safe ventilation. And it may be possible to do that to some extent. But I would argue that in many patients, that's not going to be possible. This is taken from a study from Gatinoni and colleagues, published a little over 10 years ago. And what they did was they looked again at CT scans and summarized it, looking at on the x-axis here is PEEP level. The y-axis here is gas tissue ratio. Just basically think of gas in the lung. They took slices at three different levels, the dependent region, the non-dependent region, and some region in the middle. And then they changed PEEP level, as shown here. And you can see that the, the, the characteristics of th what happened to the gas in the lungs was very different among different ventilatory, uh, among different um, regions. In this region here, the dependent region, as PEEP increased, absolutely no increase in volume. That's, if you think of the CT scan I showed you, not surprising, completely consolidated, no air gets in. <coughs> Excuse me. The upper region, the non-dependent region, you see that as PEEP increased, basically more and more distension, probably over distension up here. And in the middle group, in the middle uh, volume, the, the remember this is the same patient, this is the, this is, uh, the same patient that there was uh, an increase in, in P-flex. You can see the P-flex here. At, above this point, the inflection point, increased gas as pressure or PEEP level increased. So just think about how would you set the ventilator in this patient? If you set the ventilator to open up lung regions out here, you may over-distend these lung regions and may do nothing for these regions down here. Now, that's just three different regions. Think about 300 million alveoli. How is it going to be possible in some patients with the most severe disease to get a strategy that completely doesn't just over-distend some units and recruits those lung units? So I think that certainly in some patients, it won't be possible to develop a, a strategy that is completely non-injurious for all lung regions. And in those, I think we can use other therapies. Uh, and, and one would be anti-inflammatory therapies. So I'm just going to give you one example. This is taken from uh, in my published in 1999, looking at intratracheal anti-TNF antibody. So what uh, she did was looked at a, a, a rabbit lung lavage model in vivo. Uh, lavage the lung is shown out here. You can see that PO2 decreases down to about 100. This is a classical model of uh, infant respiratory distress syndrome. Now then, at this point here, just prior to further measurements, there was intratracheal installation of anti-TNF antibody or control. And you can see in the control group, no effect on PO2. When a low dose anti-TNF antibody was used, oxygenation improved. And with a higher dose, the oxygenation was even greater. So here's an example of where some thing that modifies the inflammatory response has an impact not only on TNF and its cascade, but in terms of oxygenation. So this suggests that this approach may be useful in terms of uh, mitigating ventilator-induced lung injury. So let me summarize then. If you think of mechanical ventilation, we know, we've known for a long time that can, this can lead to biophysical injury, whether it be barotrauma or volutrauma. Uh, over distension of the lung can lead to, to lung injury, changes in intrathoracic pressure. This can lead to increased alveolar capillary permeability. Uh, certainly we've known for five or six decades about the effects on hemodynamics. Over the past 10 years, I think we've begun to realize that there may be much more subtle injury, so-called biotrauma, with release of mediators from the lung. If one uses an injurious ventilatory strategy, one can have release of mediators, one can get neutrophils recruited to the lung, and if the ventilatory strategy continues, potentially these mediators can spill over into the systemic circulation and potentially could lead to distal organ dysfunction. And if that's the case, 
this mechanism might explain how ventilatory strategy leads to the development of multi-system organ failure and potentially death in patients who are on mechanical ventilators. So I think the important message from all this is that this looks, this looks ominous, this last slide. You know, the ventilator looks like it's killing people. Well, in fact, clearly, the ventilator is keeping people alive. What it means is we have to be very careful in how we ventilate because there can be subtle changes in, in the lung that can lead to more injury if we don't do it right, that can lead to spillover of mediators that may affect distal organs. And the important point is that we have the ability to manipulate the ventilator to actually decrease the, this, the impact and improve patients' lives and increase, uh, increase longevity in patients and decrease mortality. So thank you very much.